Before we begin our horror shorts, we would like to thank Gin Rummy Stars for sponsoring this video. Gin Rummy Stars can be played anywhere at any time on iOS and Android devices. Here's how to play. Each player is dealt 10 cards. Collect sets and runs and try to avoid the extra cards which count as deadwood. Getting a knock is game over for your opponent. Download Gin Rummy Stars today and get 1,000 coins free just for joining. Click the link in the description box below. Your goal is to complete the highest number of sets and runs to achieve more points than your opponent. My favorite part of the game is that you get to compete worldwide with thousands of players. Hey, you might even get the chance to face me. Not only does Gin Rummy Stars train your brain, but it's also free to play and extremely rewarding. By downloading Gin Rummy Stars, you'll get to create your own avatar and receive 1,000 coins for free. Click the link in the description box below. Not only is this game free, but it also supports an amazing cause. Gin Rummy Stars wants to raise awareness for animal rights. This June, they will be donating a portion of their earnings to the IFAW, which is a global nonprofit organization. They rescue, rehabilitate, and release animals and restore and protect their natural habitats. Play Gin Rummy Stars today. This next story was inspired by this disturbing dash cam footage showcasing two men with bats attempting to rob the driver. In the background, you can see them utilize their vehicle to create a blockade so that oncoming drivers would have no choice but to encounter the bandits. The driver was eventually able to narrowly escape on the side of the road. The basic plot of the story is pretty self-explanatory, so we decided to do a mashup with the notorious creature from Jeepers Creepers. There's been several conspiracy videos online showcasing alleged footage of the phenomenon, but we'll leave it up to you to decide if it's fact or fiction. I was hours away from any major city, miles from the nearest paved road and deep into a remote rural region of my county that I'm sure most so-called locals don't even know exists. And on top of everything else, I'd gotten on the road later than I planned to, which meant darkness was setting in. I got word that my great uncle had passed away and I knew I had to go visit the homestead for the burial. His surviving wife was quite elderly and their offspring would need taking care of everything for a few days. Unfortunately, I didn't have a passenger to share these experiences with on my drive out to their house in the plains. It was just me and my car with the endless expanses of field and pastures all around me, and of course my radio music. I knew I was close to getting there when I started navigating the muddy dirt roads. However, on this trip, I didn't feel quite the same benevolence I was used to. After enough time, the setting sun disappeared and gave way to darkness. It was right about then, at the end of that train of thought, when I started to wonder what had really been the cause of my great uncle's death. However, I didn't get much time to ponder this. I'd just come over a slight hill when my headlights fell over a blue van parked cockeyed in the middle of the road. There was no way to go around them without trampling through somebody's property and potentially screwing up my car. At first, it seemed obvious that they had broken down, whoever they were. But as I got closer, I wasn't so sure. Still, I wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt, that maybe they'd pushed it out into the road to get my attention. So I slowed down to a crawl and tried to gather more information. That's when the two men who'd been driving the van appeared from inside it, 
holding two baseball bats and making quick strides toward my car before I even came to a complete stop. I felt my heart jump and my pulse quicken in one of those immediate fight or flight responses. I could tell with certainty that whatever motive these guys had didn't matter, because they were clearly desperate, and I mean dangerously desperate, with that glossy animalistic look in their eye that tells you they aren't acting like human beings right now. They even looked like they'd been attacked by wild animals, with their clothes bloody and torn. I made sure that my windows were up and my doors were locked. I gripped the steering wheel with white knuckles and grounded the brakes, trying to think of a way out as they poked and prodded my car for a way in. Let us in! Come on, open up! Please, please let us in! We've been out here for two days! We won't survive another day out here! Open the damn door now! I wasn't sure what to do, but I knew the last thing I wanted was to let these guys inside my car. I shook my head at them and began to slowly back away, hoping that they would somehow remain calm and wait for someone else. But they were the first people I'd seen on that entire road. Where are you going? Let us in or we'll all die! Stop! Stop! Open the car or we will open it ourselves! One of them quickly ran behind my car and got in my way. The panic in my brain told me to just floor it and run them down, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. After trying to maneuver around them in reverse didn't work, I saw an opening forward and put the car in drive, throttling as quickly as I dared and just barely managing to get around the van without wrecking or trapping my car. Ahead of them, I could still see the two men chasing after me in my rearview mirror tripping in the darkness, homing in on the brake lights. I didn't even think about stopping for them, but I drove on cautiously into the night just to avoid any poorly timed driving mistakes. However, I kept checking my rearview mirror for them, just to see how desperate they were to get at me. I was about a hundred feet away from them when I decided I'd check one last time, and that's when I saw something that made so little sense I had to stop and try to process it. There they were, the two of them, haggard and bloody, hobbling towards me with their bats when all of a sudden, with a single flash of something slipping by from the field to the tree line at an inhuman speed, one of them was gone. Immediately I stopped and watched the other man react to this. He screamed. Then, his wary hobble turned into a full-on sprint, with which he closed the distance between us in a matter of seconds. He collided with my car once more, striking the windows harder than ever. Before I could think to get going again, he was climbing onto the hood of my car. Let me in, for the love of God, please! Don't let me die out here! And right as I thought I should heed his words, I heard footsteps pounding the earth with hellish speed. Ah! And then that man's screaming was cut short. That's when I saw the man slide down the glass with his head split down the middle, spilling the torn pieces of his brain down through the rest of his severed body as it was ripped in two. And behind the two pieces of the man which fell out of sight, shrouded in impossible darkness, was the creature that had done it. Now the only thing left in the road, staring at me through the glass of my windshield. Its haunting red eyes pierced my soul with ease. What it was, I can't even describe. It was as though my brain wouldn't even allow me to fully comprehend the horrific sight of it. Though from what I could tell, it was the shape of a human wearing a cowboy hat, along with a rugged trench coat. I slammed the gas pedal to the floor and plowed over the remains of that man's body and straight through whatever that horrible thing was, only to then have it jump on the hood of my car. It began banging its head on my windshield as I attempted to shake it off with a dozen sharp turns on the dirt road. Ah! Somebody help! Get the hell out of my windshield, you asshole! That's when the man, or thing, flew off to the side of the road as I sped off into the night. I couldn't see any signs of that thing in my rearview mirror. I wasn't too far from my relative's homestead, but those last few dozen miles were fraught with a degree of anxiety and fear I'd never felt before. When I saw my relatives, they did their best to console me, but they didn't believe what I had told them. They rather bitterly excused it as the tricks of grief upon the mind. And even when I showed them the damage that had been done to my car, and all the blood splattered on the hood, they again tried to convince me that I simply hit a large animal like a deer or a bear, and that I was going crazy over the trauma of the whole situation. After my great uncle's burial the next day, I forced my family to go out to the stretch of road where it all had happened. But somehow, there was nothing there. No van, no bodies, no creature, just mud. I don't know how to explain all of this, but the fact that his land is stalked by some predator from the depths of hell that seems to be able to cover its tracks like this makes me highly doubt that my great uncle died of a simple brain tumor, because his gouged out eyes tell me otherwise.
The following story was inspired by a disturbing dash cam video of a white figure masquerading from a distance in front of a man's vehicle. Here, you can clearly see some deranged woman holding a cane while approaching closer to the car in an unsettling manner. Here's an animation inspired by the occurrence. It was my cousin's 18th birthday, so my relatives invited me to visit their humble abode on the city outskirts, to which I immediately said yes. While I was driving along the highway, my car's GPS abruptly malfunctioned, which gave me a migraine since it was the only way I could arrive at my relative's domicile without getting lost. And then, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, my phone's battery died, and I didn't have a charger with me at the time. <sighs> what an idiot, I told myself, regretting that I failed to double-check my stuff before leaving the apartment. When I got to the gas station, it was already dusk. I bought a portable charger and then asked the cashier for directions. Fortunately, the man was kind enough to offer me a shortcut. I was so grateful that I even gave him a tip. However, before I left, the cashier called my attention and said, Hey mister, why don't you spend a night at the motel a few blocks away? It's getting pretty dark out there. Although I appreciated his empathy, I explained that I had a party to attend, so there was no turning back. Oh, yeah, I see. Totally understandable, he said, scratching his head warily. His gestures were on edge, almost as though he wanted to warn me about something. So, curiously, I asked, what's the matter? The guy averted his gaze for a brief moment and said, oh, it's nothing. You have a safe trip now. Afterward, he turned his back and ignored me all the way through, which seemed rather odd. Now that I was all set, I was on the road again, listening to some rock music on the radio. But unfortunately, it was incredibly dark this time without a moon to give me some natural light. Coming from concrete surfaces to a long, narrow stretch of earth and roads, I knew I was no longer in the city. And with only the car's headlights to rely on, it was hard to tell whether I was still on the right track or not. Then, moments later, the music on the radio was replaced by a high-pitched ringing sound before abruptly turning into static noise. Following this incident, my headlights lost their power, startling me quite a bit. The car, enveloped in darkness, surrounded by tall grass fields on both sides, made me feel uneasy. Am I lost or something? Upon checking my cell phone's GPS and internet access, for some bizarre reason they weren't working at all. Ugh, great! So much for the charger! I exclaimed furiously. Eventually, I decided to turn off the radio, but as soon as I did, I heard something gradually approaching me. I couldn't tell who or what it was because I didn't stay long enough to find out. So, I hit on the gas immediately and put the vehicle on reverse. I shook off the thought and finally, I met some locals who knew my relatives and were accommodating enough to point me to their house. When I arrived at my destination, I sighed in relief as I joined the celebration. I had the opportunity to enjoy myself, forgetting the amount of stress I had to endure moments earlier. However, avoiding alcoholic beverages was necessary to veer away from car accidents on my way home. At one point, I had to use the faucet to wash my hands and my tired face, but since there were tons of guests, I couldn't use the restroom or the main kitchen sink. Luckily, they had a dirty kitchen at the back of their house, facing the riverbank, which my aunt said I could use. There were a few dim light posts in the area, and it was ultimately silent compared to what was going on inside the domicile. But, as I washed my face, I caught the scent of something rather unpleasant and it smelled like rotten flesh. So I instantly wiped my face with a towel, thinking I should head back inside as soon as possible. And then, in a split second, I heard a horrifying induced gurgle sound, similar to the one from the movie The Grudge. The voice sounded so close to my ear that I jerked and glanced behind me. Next to a tree, there was a woman in a white garment, and her body appeared to be shuddering as she stood there in the dark, her eyes eerily fixated on me. Frightened, I went back inside and sat in a corner until the party was over. Then, when most of the guests had gone home, I approached some of my relatives gathered in the living room. Anxious, I hollered, Did any of you invite a strange lady wearing all white? She's really old and carries a cane? One of my cousins looked at me confused and replied, 
Well, none of the people here today brought a cane, that's for sure. But I saw a woman in the back. She was having spasms and she reeked of a corpse. Moments later, one of my uncles came forward and offered to accompany me to the back of the house holding a flashlight. However, upon checking the area, there was darkness and nothing more. When I went back inside, some of my relatives expressed sincerity, while others were nettled by my lack of consideration towards the kids, scaring them off. So I apologized for my behavior and left. On my way home, I was surrounded by silence once more. It was a tranquil evening until I saw something slowly crossing the road. It materialized a few meters away from the car, and there was nothing to suggest that it was a feral animal because of the way it stood. Albeit crooked, the white figure in front of me had long black hair and a cane. Soon, I realized that it was the same lady I saw back at the party. This time, however, she wasn't just standing there. With one leg crippled, she sauntered towards me, her eyes deadpanned and her jaws unhinging most unnaturally as she opened her mouth to reveal small, sharp teeth. I constantly wailed. Get back! Stay away from me! Get the hell away from my car! But no matter how much I tried to warn her and intimidate her with the car's honking, she still persisted in approaching me despite her frail body. Suddenly, the car wouldn't start and the headlights flickered. Come on! What's the matter with you? Help! Help! I desperately turned the keys as I struggled to hit on the gas. The woman was near the hood when the car's engine finally worked, allowing me to leave immediately. I motioned backward and took a complete alternate path, never looking back. When I arrived home, I was so exhausted that I instantly went to bed. The following day, I thought it had all just been my imagination until I checked my dash camera and saw the same terrifying woman with her mouth wide open. I didn't know who she was, but I hoped to never see her again. The video portrayed here surfaced the internet for a few years now. It showcases a truck driving through a one-way road and encountering a blockade ahead of him. There appears to be a few men strolling by the side of that road, casually flagging the trucker to stop. But what makes the story more chilling was what lied ahead. The next animation portrays a dramatized version of the alleged event. I've seen a lot on the road as a trucker. Seen all sorts of breakdowns, road kills, and wrecks. Not to mention more than my fair share of sketchy roadside stops. But there's one story that tops them all in my years of experience. It's so crazy that my boss didn't even believe it until he saw the dash cam footage. But it's something I can never really forget. I've lost a lot of sleep over the nightmares of remembering it. And for a while there, it almost cost me my ability to do my job. If anyone is willing to listen, there's lessons in this story that anybody on the road should learn from. Whether you're a biker, a four-wheeler, or even if you drive an 18-wheeler like me. For one, if you're driving cross-country, Make sure to take extra precautions. Don't be like me and think you're going to be fine driving through no man's land just because you got years of experience or a piece in your passenger seat. Of course, with current trucking regulations, you can't drive for more than 8 hours per day. So the trade-off that many truckers make when they want to make better time is to drive through the night. Specifically from 10pm to 6am, when the roads are the emptiest and you won't be held up by traffic. Personally, at the time, I wasn't thinking about the risks associated with night driving. I just wanted to make it to my destination as soon as possible. The whole night started off strange. For the first few hours, the road was eerily empty. Normally, at any time of night or day, there are other truckers on the road with you, but not this night. I felt like I was totally alone, the only person on the road. The only thing that kept me company was the moon. 
which was dressing itself as an omen of bad things to come, in the shape of a crescent and the color of blood, staring me down for its entire slow crawl of the horizon. But things really turned for the worse when I hit my first pit stop for the night. I'd been driving for a few hours at that point, and I was in need of a place to stop, relieve myself, and refuel the truck. Given that, your choices for gas stations are slim. You pretty much have to take what you can get. I kept my eyes peeled as I parked and stepped out to refuel. Again, I was the only person in sight. The fluorescent lights added to the sense of unease that was slowly building in my gut, complete with a droning buzz. After paying at the pump, I thought about trying to go into the little convenience store that went along with the gas station but at first glance I noticed it was definitely closed down for the night. I opted to use the little toilet in the back of my cab, which I tried not to overuse for maintenance purposes. I think I'd gone several hours without seeing a single soul, until I stepped out again to unhook the pump. Where is everybody? I was looking all around the flat, dark expanse for signs of life when I saw a haggard-looking man in the distance stumbling towards me. When he realized I'd seen him, he started sprinting haphazardly like some cracked-out Tom Brady about to body-check me. He looks so much like a zombie that it sent a shiver down my spine. The man makes a full stop inches away from a collision and says, Sir, I need to talk to you. I need to tell you something. I had no intentions of chatting with him. I got a bad feeling about the whole place and got the heck out of there. I climbed into the cab while the man kept shouting, Where the hell are you going? Please, you need to listen to me! I pulled out immediately and headed for the long on-ramp back onto the interstate at a quick yet cautious rate of speed. I was glad to get out of that stop, but I couldn't help but look back through my mirrors. What I saw behind me made my heart jump. That same man was chasing after me, running and flailing his arms at me like he was trying to get me to stop. But I wasn't in any state of mind to stop for anyone who might give me trouble. So I pressed on, accelerating a little. Right before he was out of sight, I took one last glance in the mirror. And that's when I noticed a flash of something so quick that I wasn't even sure if I'd really seen it or if my eyes had played tricks on me. The face of that man as he passed under a light was covered in the dark red of blood. I didn't know if it was a self-inflicted wound or if he just hit his head on something after our encounter. Either way, my nerves were hopped up and wired, but I told myself to just keep going forward with my eyes on the road. Unfortunately, I didn't get far. What the hell was that? I was halfway up the on-ramp when I ran over what seemed to be either roadkill or a very large object. I pressed on as there was no way in hell I was down to catch a potential hit-and-run charge. I then approached a bridge ahead in the distant lights of some port city when I saw a blockage in the road. Laying there was a full tree branch across the entire pavement. This made no sense. There had been no major storms in the past few days and there weren't even any trees near the interstate at all. But I didn't have time to think about that. As I started to apply the brakes to come to a stop, believing that all I had to do was get out and move the branch, an unholy sight rushed in on me. From their hiding spots behind the barriers on both sides of the ramp came a mob of dozens, maybe even a full hundred people all converging on my truck, which was almost completely stopped by then. Many of them were waving me down, signaling me to stop. But they weren't the good Samaritans they were trying to appear to be, and I already knew this. They started hurling rocks and branches at my truck. My heart started pounding, sweat pouring down my face. I did my best to keep cool and not panic. Stop the truck and get the hell out now! Leave me alone, you cartel junkies, or I'm calling the cops! First I tried going back, throwing the truck into reverse and backing away. I was going to try to get all the way back to the gas station where there might be some safety in numbers with the other truckers, but again I didn't get far. Members of the mob that were trying to get to me were surrounding me on all sides, getting behind me to block my exit. They knew I wouldn't have the level of heartlessness required to run them over, but I can't lie, I certainly thought about it. I then put the rig into drive and floored it. I plowed straight through the blockade, cringing as I heard the wood snapping itself into the components of my truck. Thankfully, I made it through the debris and was able to get up to speed on the interstate. To make sure I'd really lost them, I jerked the rig around to shake off anyone who might be hanging on the back. I was able to get another 50 miles before one of my tires blew out from being punctured with wood splinters. I was well and far enough away from that mess though. The rest of the story isn't as interesting. Just me stranded on the side of a barren road waiting for a Mack tow truck. Of course, I contacted the authorities and everything, but all of that is out of my control at this point. The only thing that's left for me is to move on from the whole thing. To this day, I still have trouble sleeping over it. I always get caught up thinking what would have happened if they just waited another minute for me to get out of the truck. If I would have ended up like that other guy I saw, or even worse. One thing is for sure though, I'm glad my truck was equipped with a dash cam. I wasn't even thinking about the camera the whole night, but it turned on automatically and captured the whole thing. Which not only saved me from getting fired from my job, but also landed me some compensation pay. 
and provided a cautionary tale for other Roadhogs to learn from, that you can never know what's around that bend.